we're going to go ahead and record this for the 203 other faculty who are not here today. <laughs> and um, so go ahead and, and turn it on and welcome the folks that are here to our uh, CSS workshop. Um, just want to give everybody a little bit of a background of what we've been doing about student evaluations here at Robert Morris. Um, I talk a little bit about the pilot study that we conducted during the spring semester. Um, and then we'll have uh, Diane Clements, who's here with us from CSS, talk to us about uh, implementing the, the CSS instrument for uh, the fall semester. We're hoping to get it started uh, right off the bat, even with the first eight weeks. Um, and then, of course, we'll do the second eight weeks and the, um, uh, the 15 week all at once. And uh, so in addition to myself and Diane, uh, Don Lane is here. He's the one that administers the program. So we'll uh, see if he has any words. But we'll kind of keep this informal, but at the same time give you enough information so that um, each of our faculty members knows what's uh, coming down uh, in the fall semester. Uh, during the spring, we did do a um, system pilot study and um, don't know whether you might have been read into this or not, but the idea was to, uh, to we created a task force that put together the pilot instrument that we used. You were on it, right, weren't you, John? I was involved in some discussions. I don't think I was on this. Okay. Either. But anyhow, we, you know, we had representatives from each of the schools and we put together a, a pilot instrument. And one of the nice things about the CSS product is that that instrument can be adjusted at any time. Uh, it can also be um, uh, focused on schools, or it can be focused even down to department levels, or even program levels if you wanted it. Um, keeping in mind that the more that we streamline the instrument, the more that we uh, make it unique to a particular department, the less you're going to be able to compare your results with anybody else's. And so um, we've already had a discussion with the Federation uh, Executive Committee. And I think we came to an agreement that uh, what we're going to do, at least in the fall semester, is to, um, is to keep with the pilot instrument that we had and not make any changes across the university for the pilot and allow the individual departments and schools to use the fall semester to decide whether they want to uh, make their own uh, their own unique one that we would uh, that we would kick off in the uh, spring keeping at least the same questions that that we currently have so if you want to add to them that's great you'll certainly be able to do that so then again, we have some comparisons that we can make across the university based on a standard set of, of questions. So um, the, the uh, pilot study was, um, was conducted with 54 full-time faculty representing 10 different departments across the campus. So these were faculty members who volunteered to run, if you remember, both instruments during the spring semester. So we wanted to compare uh, the two instruments. So they had to agree to run both the SERS 2 that we've been running and the CSS instrument. And 54 of those faculty agreed to do that, uh, accounting for about 106 sections. So those 54 faculty were running, on average, two sections apiece. Okay? Um, we distributed those in time to get them uh, to get them back. Uh, if you remember, so 106 um, instruments went out to to those 54 faculty. Uh, we received um, less than the 106 back from the SERS 2 because if you remember the concept of the SERS 2 is you don't get a report back unless you have at least five evaluations and so um, what we ended up getting back was something less than the 106 SIRS but we got all 106 uh, back for um, the CSS actually 
to be precise. Uh, out of the 106 SIRS that went out, 69 of them came back. Okay? Out of the 106 CSS instruments that went out, all 106 came back. So we took a look at the, the two reports. We sent those, Don sent those reports out to the faculty members. And then a couple weeks ago, a month or so ago now, I followed it up to all the 54 uh, faculty and said, here's a couple of questions that we want you to answer. Which one did you like best? Which one provided you with the best information? Uh, which, which one uh, did you feel was easier to administer? We asked them a, a series of those questions. And I've got, out of the 54 uh, faculty, I've got about 30 responses back. Okay, so that wasn't bad. That was about half of them, give or take a little bit. And um, out of the 30 or so that we got back, all but three of them said, I like the CSS instrument better. It allowed us to focus in on the questions that we wanted. It allowed the students to give feedback that the SERS instrument really doesn't do very well. Um, and they all gave, you know, those, all but three gave a thumbs up for um, the, the CSS instrument. As it turns out, of the three that didn't, um, one of them basically said, I don't care which one you use. <laughs> okay. And said they're both, you know, they <coughs> give me some information, but how valuable it is in, in my class, they, they still have some questions. Okay. So um, uh, that's, that was the pilot study. That's how it went. And, and so again, I had a chance to sit down with the Federation Executive Committee and, and ask them that, you know, to, to consider uh, recommending that we move to the CSS instrument and uh, we should be getting that back from them shortly. Um, we will not consider running both sets of instruments anymore. As you might expect, that was a major, major effort on Don's part uh, as we went out to all of the faculty figuring out which ones was going to do both and um, th that's very difficult. Okay, so that's, that's kind of where we are. And so we had an opportunity, Diane was, was uh, she is our, our customer rep for CSS out in this area. Just so happens that she was in the local area uh, anyways and so we set this up as a way for her to come in and what we wanted to do is talk a little bit in general about the instruments, see if you guys have got any questions about it. But again, as a preface to this, the CSS instrument can be delivered in one of three ways. Yes, we can do paper and pencil. And the overall advantage of paper and pencil has always been I can distribute it in my classroom and I can be confident that I will have a response rate that approaches 70% because I still got some students in class that you hand them a piece of one of those things and they either don't fill it out at all or they fill it out wrong or they mark Mickey Mouse on it or whatever they do, you don't have a valid uh, response. So that's, we can continue doing that uh, with CSS. Um, the second way is what they call uh, the WIC method. Web in class. Web in class. And this is what I interpreted as a smartphone app, okay? So you can literally, you get a little QR uh, emblem, and she'll show you those in a minute. Uh, and we're actually gonna let you guys run through those so you can try one out and see how it works. But, the, you know, the students pull out their cell phone, their smartphone, they hit the QR on it, they go in, they do the, um, they do the, uh, the instrument, and it's done. And so it's not going to take them much longer to do the paper and pencil in class as it will to do this, the WIC method in class, okay? So the response rate should be, should be as good as the paper and pencil. The advantage of doing the WIC, and I hope I'm probably stealing some of your thunder, but I, I, I want to let, let everybody know that we've really studied this. This is, this is something we've really looked at. The advantage is um, with the paper and pencil, the students can give you student comments. 
which they scan in and they will send to the faculty and hopefully you can read them. But with the WIC, they're going to use their thumbs and their forefingers like they do with a text thing and you'll get that response back in a text-based form. So much easier to read and much more confident of what it is they're saying. So if a faculty member gives 15 minutes to, to do the paper and pencil, they can give 15 minutes to do this. We should get similar results. The third method you know, is, uh, is a web-based URL. Email. Okay? Hmm? Email. I'm sorry, yeah, we call it email. Okay, and so the student will get an email with a, with a link to it. They'll go out there and they'll, uh, they'll do the, the same instrument, but they'll do, it, um, they'll do it on the web. Disadvantage to that is now we're back into what kind of response rate are we going to get or the student's going to actually do it. Okay, and so we're going to limit that entirely to totally online courses. We have no other choice. An online student, how you know, we're not going to send them a paper and pencil, and you know, we're not going to do the the smartphone. So they're they're going to be um, be taking it that way. So that's the three formats, and I want Diane to kind of talk more about them because she's smarter about the reports and the things that we'll get back. So I'll stop talking now, and um, introduce Diane Clemens to you. And um, please open up the questions, you know, the more questions that, that you have, uh, the better this is going to, going to be done. And so uh, we're having it videotape now and we'll just uh, we'll try to capture everything in the video. Diane? Okay, did you get one of these parts? I did not. Don, did you get one? Thank you. Alrighty. Okay, it's on my mind here. Um, so I've given you a package that gives you some samples to take a look at. And if we take out the first page and the first envelope, when you get into the site for doing the survey, it's going to ask you to be entered the online code. All right? Now your packages are going to arrive the same as they did in paper. You'll get an envelope, you'll have all the course information at the top, and you can verify what course you're giving this information to because if you switch this between section one and section three, you're going to be getting evaluations for different courses. If you do that, just let Don know and he will tell us to switch the data from section one to section three. Okay, if you've made that mistake. But inside of this package is instructions to you or your proctor on when to do these evaluations and how to do it and hopefully ahead of time We've asked the student to download a barcode app on their phone if they have not got one already. If they don't want to download a free barcode reading app, they can put the URL into their browser. So you do need Wi-Fi access in your classroom. So if you have 16 students in the class, you're going to get 16 unique codes for that particular class. You'll take a card and rip them apart, they're perforated, and randomly hand them out so I have no student ID, I have no student email address. This is totally anonymous, unless you want to sit down and write every number that you gave you and every student, <laughs> but you're not going to get any data back with this number on it, so there's no way to tell. So it's completely anonymous, and that's what we're doing. Now the reason why I gave you an extra card is because while I was down the shore in Cape May, I had them package these for us, and they used the wrong URL code, so the QR's wrong, so I wanted you to use this one that we had sent to Larry this morning via email. And that's a good example, Don, if you call me and say, oh my gosh, we've handed out all the packages and I forgot an entire department or an instructor or I need you know, an extra package for this, that or the other, I can email you that page of cards and you can do what I did and cut them out and hand them to the instructor and we can get them done that day. So we can take care of that, oops, if it happens and it does, it happens. So if you were to take your phone and pull up your barcode reading app, do you have one on you? Or I can show you what happens with mine. And I hold it over the QR and it comes up. I open my browser 
and it goes to Robert Morris University. And that's your survey. And in there, you're going to enter the number on the card. How'd you do? I'm just installing it now. <laughs> okay. So when I go to put that number in, I put that in, which I've done already, and I hit continue, and it takes me to the survey. So they'll scroll through, they'll finish the survey, they'll hit submit, and they'll get a thank you page that says your survey has been sent to CSS, your data is completely anonymous, results will not be given to the instructors until after grades have been submitted. Now if they don't hit submit, the survey is not in. They can go back and change it later if they want to. But once they hit submit, that number is no longer useful, so this is now checked and it's no longer useful. That's web in class. Now what I'm looking at here is you've been doing paper. And your paper packages came in. You have a copy of your survey in there. We're now handing these out to the students, collecting them back from the students, and usually the instructors are asked to leave the classroom. So now you don't have to leave the classroom because if you're doing web in class, the only way you're going to know what's being put in is if you're standing up someone's shoulder, staring at what they're doing on their phone. Um, I don't think you're going to see that happen. With paper, you're going to see the responses coming back. You have to get a proctor to return these to Don Lane. Don Lane's got to package them up and ship them back to us. Once they get to us, we're going to examine them for markings. And if the instructor name has changed or you don't like the course title or something's been changed, I could get 10 variations of different things from a particular class. If the instructor says to the students, oh, change it from environmental science to environmental studies and health, you know, whatever. I'm going to get all kinds of different responses from the students. So when you're looking at a paper survey, you've got tail marks that go off from the bubbles, that hit the other bubbles. You, they might change their mind on one bubble, move to another bubble. And we do look for that. I mean, if I see two bubbles, it's going to pop up on my screen if I'm in that, in that uh, job function. And it's going to say, can't decide. And we look at it on the screen and we decide whether or not the student put an X in. Sometimes they write, sorry, and then this one over here. And you can follow exactly what they're doing on the page and select the correct bubble. If the bubbles are identical, and I can't tell which one's right, then they both get deleted. And that data is not collected for that question. So if we go to the extreme, one side to the other, it's not going to affect your scoring because we've made a decision that they're identical, so we're not collecting it. So there's a lot that goes into paper scanning and verifications and corrections before your reports are actually done. If we can go with the online method, we eliminate all of this hassle. You eliminate the shipping, you eliminate the collections of paper. It's, it's a nightmare that we can get rid of. So, a quick question, if, if, if I may. Sure. Um, if, a, if my class does the WIC option, mm -hmm. does that data get to you immediately? So, although you wouldn't literally do this, if my students completed the surveys on Wednesday, although I wouldn't have access to the results, they'd be done as early as Thursday. So it's also they'd, quicker. They'd be done as soon as they hit submit. Oh, that's right, because you don't have to compile. Okay, yep. The reports aren't done. Right. But the data's in. The data is in instant. The data is collected as soon as they hit submit. Okay. And the reports are done? When you tell me the session is over or the semester is over, we download all of that data, pull it together, and then create your reports. Perfect. So we get you the reports in literally days rather than weeks, which is what it takes us now. We don't have to go and get our own reports. That's right. We, we do did not. this. I like that. <laughs> Yay. If anybody wants to see the on a smartphone, I got I you got, got it yours? loaded on. I don't know if you guys saw it. I, you see oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. What is the response rate for WIC relative to paper pencil? A very slight percentage less than paper and pencil, because you have an occasional student who says, "I don't feel like doing this." Well, I was. I mean, I know. Uh, basically, everyone time. has a smartphone, right. but they don't necessarily all bring them to class. You know what I mean? Right. And at the same time, you also have the paper student who says, "The heck with this." Puts a line down the middle and hands it in. <laughs> Doesn't pay any attention to it or you get blank papers. Um, I've had 
you know, on many occasions I've had instructors return packages sealed, completely sealed, Proctor signed over it, and you know, Donna sent them back to us, but I'm talking other colleges. We open the package and every paper in there is blank. Huh. Because so the Proctor stood in front of the class and said, there's these lousy surveys, and they hand them out, and they say, okay, let me collect them all back up again, and stick them back in the package, or the instructor doesn't hand them out, or believes they've been handed out, and they haven't been, and we get blank surveys back. We will keep track of that. So when these surveys come back in, if there's a change of instructor name, a change of title, change of number, or they're all blank, we have a tracking sheet that keeps a record so that when you call and say, well, I know I handed the package back in. Yeah, you did, but every one of them was blank. There was no data. If they answer one question, that is data, and we will collect that. Hmm. So uh, it does happen, unfortunately, with web in class. The students sitting in the classroom, um, the instructor's in the front, which makes it an assignment. Uh, the instructor hasn't left the room to leave it to its own device. Um, they're sitting there with idle time, and it's your time, not their time. So they're most likely going to do that survey because they have nothing else that they're doing right now, unless they're working on their homework that they didn't do. You know, it's, it's going to get done because it's on your time and not on their time. So for the student who has not shown up in class that day, um, they show up following, you know, the following week or a few days later, you have an extra card sitting around from that group that you were given, and you can hand it to Susan and say, here, take this home and get this done before Friday, because our you know, the surveys are going to close on Friday. So with the WIC, you, you don't have to do it in one sitting. You've got right. options to... Right, right. But you don't want to give up too much of your class time. So if you've done it on you know, Thursday at 1 o'clock, next Tuesday when that student shows up, you can say, you've got until Friday to get this done. I'm not going to take any time from my class. Take it home, put in that URL or scan the QR and get it done. Okay. And that's done that way. If you send them all home, if you decide you don't want to take time in the class and you say, okay, this is what's very important for these ins instructors to know, is that report, when it comes back, the scoring is important to you. You want a decent score and you want viable data. If you sent these surveys home, whether it be via email or any other method that sends them out of the classroom, they're now on their own time. They don't care about a survey. They don't want to do a survey unless they're the love or hate relationship. You lose everybody in the middle. And out of 20 students, you're going to get three responses. And are they going to be good? It's going to affect the scoring. So you want to continue, you know, keep this process in the classroom, so that you my have to. My online, so I might. <laughs> you have no totally choice. Online, so. <laughs> so where you're you're going with encouragement and reminders constantly. Mm -hmm. We will send out three reminders to the online students to say your surveys are not done, and the menu will show them of the four or five courses they're taking which ones they've finished, which ones they haven't, which ones are expired from an earlier session. But we'll send three reminders out, and usually our reminders would start out, and I don't know that yours do, we will start out by saying, you're gonna to continue to receive these reminders until you finish your surveys. <laughs> of course, there is an end, but we just don't tell them that. Um, <coughs> if there is a way that we could eliminate the emails that they get online regarding fire drills and um, uh, cafeteria menus because my students are saying they get a plethora of emails that are, they don't, I mean, it's almost noise that they just say, I can't deal with right. all these, unless it comes from right. me or through Blackboard. Uh, can it be sent through Blackboard? It can be posted on Blackboard. It can be posted as a URL link on the, on the but Blackboard you could site. That's that. for the email one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can post the link on Blackboard. Okay, right. but that wouldn't be something that you all would do. No, I would give that to Don. He would give it to the Blackboard liaison who would put that out there, and then the student would enter their email address <coughs> to get to the surveys that belong to them. So it, is that something that we are going to do with the online, is that it would be posted on Blackboard? Or as a professor, I would have to post it myself on my Blackboard page? Right now, we're going to go with the email method because it has a stronger response rate. Really? If you are telling you know, 500 students to go out to the web and find this site on Blackboard and go do the survey, you'll get a very small response if you are sending an email directly to them and repeatedly. But they have, they're on Blackboard doing their coursework, yeah. so they're in there doing their course, so they are there. I mean, we can do it both ways, actually. 
I'm thinking we of an announcement that they would have a by putting that out there. And so that would be the easiest way to do it. Mm -hmm. the, the faculty member can, can set up an announcement, put the link in the announcement, post it on the blackboard. Now, how will I know when it gets sent out? Will they send it to the professor? Good question. I'll ask Diane. Because I know I get an email now for the um, the evaluations that like it's you know your students are. Because that's whenever it has like my password to get my you get response. two emails right one with the password, password one saying that it's been sent out. So with the email, Diane, does the instructor get notified that the email that the emails are going out to the right. students on the left hand side of your package behind these two envelopes that you got is a stapled group on the left side. Okay. All right. The first one is an email that goes out to the instructor that says your students today have received. There you go. And that is, you know, just an instruction basically that tells you please encourage them, please remind them, push this, push this, push this. For the student who says, I never got it, I deleted it, I can't find it, um, there is a link in here that you give to the student. The student can go out to that link and they could do it right there in class. Enter their student email address and it will bring them their menu. So that's the link you could put in the blackboard. Mm -hmm. I can just copy some of that. Just, just copy it. Uh, the whole thing, put it right into an announcement. Yeah. And you're done. Here now you the go. next page is the letter that goes to the student that says you're being asked to do your evaluations of your courses. Please get them done. And this is a hyperlink in the email. So they just click on the link in the email and they're there. What it's going to take them to is the menu of courses, which is the next page. So if they're in four or five or six courses that they're taking that are being evaluated, they're going to see all of those courses listed. Now, over on the right side, it says View Survey. If the survey is expired, it's going to say expired. If the survey is completed, it's going to say View Receipt. Those that say View Survey are the courses that still need to be evaluated. And that's only their courses, no one else's. It's linked up to their email address. Which is basically the right <coughs> Then you're going to come to your Robert Morris survey. And that's a sample. You've got two samples. You've got the online sample and the paper sample in this package. And then the very last page is a thank you or a receipt page. Now that receipt page can be used for an incentive. So if you as an instructor want to do an incentive, let's say, you know, I'll give a, a pizza party if I have a 100% return. Um, I'm giving an extra point or no homework this week or you know, whatever type of incentive you want to put together in your mind. You could do it by department or you could do something college-wide. Let's say we pick one from each department and say you're getting a $50 gift certificate to the bookstore or something like that. So turn in your receipts to me, all right? Make a photocopy of them or e you know, uh, save them and email it to me. However, is I can see the students seeing that as um, no longer anonymous. That they well, it's anonymous that you don't know what they said, but yeah. you know, like if you only had five students, then you you would kind of know those five students that, that filled it out. I, yeah. I mean, I, I understand yeah. what you're saying, but I can also see the students coming back and saying, a lot of "I'm not going to fill it out because you're going to know that I did it." Yeah, and if I'm the only student who did it, you know, you're going to know. Um, that mentality has changed over the years because now we're online doing our banking and our this and our placing our orders and putting out our credit card numbers and you name it. There's a ton of things out there that have our identity on it. In this case, I mean, you're, you should mention to the students, as we have in the emails and in, in the survey itself, that no, identif no identification of who the student is goes back to the school. When you receive those reports, you know that you've got responses from 15 students. You don't know who's who. Mm -hmm. um, in this particular case, there is a code that is populated. It's an online PIN code, which is on that top line there. That code does not relate to anything we've spoken about previous to right this second. It's not the survey number. It is not the student ID. It's not the email address. It's not the course code. It is a random, unique code that is created when you hit submit. So if you said to the students, bring me copies, and one of the students did a survey and then made 10 photocopies of their receipt, you get 10 copies with the same code, that's a problem. Hmm. They're all completely different, unique, random codes. Hmm. 
And on the um, email that you send to the instructor, is it possible to put the um, email, the um, what the email is going to look like, the what the heading is going to look like, so that the student can be looking for that in their all as far their as the subject line. Yeah. Yes. So, um, is this subject this is, line is the, is that right. what they get also? That's what they're going to get. Okay. So on the student one, it says RMU Student Evaluation Instruction, Fall 16. So you're as, asking, as a professor, I would say, okay. look for this mm -hmm. subject line that has this and yeah, don't please delete respond it. to it. I like that. <laughs> don't like delete that. it. Yeah, we know, we know that there's a problem with students getting flooded by emails. They, they just, yeah. you know, most, I, I've even talked to some students who said, I don't even use email anymore. I only use Facebook or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, or they only answer it if it's a professor's. Um, it's got email. the professor's email on it. Yeah. Yeah. So they do get so, a lot of them. You know, but. Uh, I don't know how you Keep in mind a lot of the emails have several purpose. If you overgeneralize in that interpretation, you're going to miss some things like applying for graduation right. and, and other mm -hmm. types of relevant. Which we know also have to say. Sure that oftentimes just yeah. it's overlooked. But they're looking at things that a person on campus would only be concerned about. If you're in Chicago yeah. or California, you don't really care what's going on in the cafeteria. Exactly. Yeah, Absolutely. so it is nice to know through the... Um, yeah. Well, you know, when, when, you get this e when you get the email that says, Dear instructor, your students are receiving this email today, that might also be a good time for you to jump right online and oh, well. send it to the students and say, Hey, you're getting an email today. You know, this is yeah. from you now. Right. You know, That's what I would do. Yeah. So all sorts of things we can do to Perfect. Perfect. So that's delivery. Do you have any questions on delivery modes? Mm -hmm. I think the um, hope is that eventually you'll be able to get away from paper entirely. And if we can cut out paper and all of the processing that goes with it, it cuts down the costs quite a bit. A good, too. like almost 30 to 40 percent goes down. Uh, on the other side, we have your reports. So this is a tutorial on how to read the reports on the right-hand side. And you don't need to go through that. I will do that with you. This is a, an actual RMU evaluation report. So looking across the top, you've got all, all of your identification, and what you definitely want to look at is the number of questionnaires completed for this section and what the initial enrollment was. So if you're looking at two returned and 19 that went out, you're not looking at very good data. All right, so that's, that's the first clue on any report you're looking at is what, what is the data back to find out whether or not you're looking at viable data. All of your demographic information is up top. The key to the statements is at the bottom, which is the description of your questions on the survey. And then 1 through 13 is listed down on the left-hand side of that block, which is now going to show you the frequency of responses entered for each of those 19 students. So you can see how they scored each of these questions. The first column after those frequency of responses is what your average score is for each statement in this class section. The next column is all courses taught by you, the instructor. So if you've got four or five or six classes, they're all averaged into there so you can see how this section is doing compared to all of your classes. Then we'll compare it to all of the courses in this department, all of the courses in this school, and all courses university-wide. Now the percentile bracket is by the university. It's picking out the 10th and the 90th percentile for that statement across the entire university. So if you jump back to the section column, how does your section statements fit within the 10th to the 90th percentile? That gives you an idea of where you stand there. And again, I can't stress that the whole idea is to get as much data back as possible. Because if you've only got two or three responses, then it's not worth looking at. This is a sample of a commentary page that you would get from your system online. 
Now what's unique about this is we have given each survey a number. So if there were, you know, 15 surveys entered, each of them had a different number, 101, 102, 103, 104, et cetera. And what we're looking to do is show you the commentary responses to each of the questions. And granted, again, this is not your survey, this is someone else's, because there's, you can see there's 19 questions, we only have 13. But what you're looking at is if there is a negative comment made throughout the comments, the question you have is, is this across the board through all of the students or is this just one student with a negative attitude? So the survey number helps you to point out that survey number 107 is a particular student and that student is the one with the negative comments. No one else. And that should help you feel better. Hopefully. <laughs> Where, where do you see that one? Oh, you were just well, using one. So, so 319 one. Okay. looks like. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't that see That person has given some nice comments. Okay. Yeah. Right. So and, if, if, uh, if there was somebody there that was, was nasty, hopefully you're finding out it's the same student throughout all the nasty comments and everybody else is fine. That's very useful. That's a, I like that. Yeah, that's okay. very useful. I like that a lot. So that's, that's why we've numbered the surveys, and that's just an internal number that we created from the responses so that you can see which comments belong to a particular survey. Cool. It'd be nice if you could track them, that person throughout all of the courses. <laughs> <laughs> see if, if the, the, the negative person see if it's is just you, professor. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Or, Are they the, negative with everybody? Yeah. <laughs> I agree. All right, and then the CEV trend analysis is uh, something that's excellent to share with the instructors because it shows their process over time. Uh, so as we go on through Robert Morris, we will be creating one for every semester and we will go back. We can go back four semesters or we can do just the academic year. This is great for FARS. Absolutely. And portfolios. And portfolio, and, yeah. Right. And for promotion and tenure. So you'll see that the scale at the bottom is red, blue, and green. Uh, you don't want to see the red. You would prefer to see the green, obviously. Up at the top right hand corner is your key to what the constructs are. So we've taken the questions in your survey, and you and I should work on this and make sure that we've got them aligned properly. Mm -hmm. um, take the questions in your survey and find out which ones are related to effective communication, which ones are related to positive attitude towards students, which ones are related to fairness in grades and exams. And those responses from the students are remapped into a new set of averages that are displayed through the CEV reports. So column C1 would be effective communication, C2 is organization of subject matter, et cetera. And then when, at the very end, if you ask the question, would you take this instructor again, or would you recommend this course to others, any type of generalized, highly satisfaction question, you know, a, a basic satisfaction question, we'll create a report for just that, that will let you know whether or not there are any courses that are definitely in trouble. So if you see a red mark coming in take again, that's a problem. So that's the only time that you want to be concerned about <coughs> that class. Um, the overall section average at the end is not the overall section average for these constructs. It's taken from the statistical report. The overall section average is from your statistical report. All right, the rest of this is your constructs. Now, something else you need to take a look at is the columns for out and back. How many surveys went out? How many surveys came back? So before you judge those averages, do you have enough data back to create a decent average? Will this be sent to the program directors and the department heads, or like for all of the people in the department? How, how do we get this report? Um, the CEV reports are on the master drive, and when you decide it's appropriate, we then release them to the department heads. The longitudinal can go to the instructors, no, no, nothing else. Yeah. A lot of flexibility with this. This is. Is there? Would there be a reason why it could go to program directors um, at the same time it went to department heads? No reason. Because, I mean, that's, I think, you know, we are the ones dealing with the, the 
professors. Sure. Uh, that, uh, we'll, we'll it would save them. I'm sure they wouldn't have any problems with the program directors having them. It would save them from having to forward them to. Uh, we, we can make that decision. Okay. When we have our departmental meeting coming up in another week, I, I want to yeah, give the same presentation mm -hmm. uh, to the department heads because one of the things that that we do now uh, that takes a great deal amount of time uh, for Don is, and I think you guys know this, he will send out an individual letter to every faculty member at, you know, about this time of the semester. And he's asking, do you want to do this survey? Do you want paper and pencil? Do you want the electronic version? Okay. He asked that letter to be sent back to him actually you have it sent back to me in, in, in some cases and I have to get you know I give it to him but and so as Don will tell you some of the letters don't come back some of the letters come back they're not signed so you know there's a lot of confusion that goes on with this when we do this system and I'll talk to the department heads about this on September the 15th when we have our retreat the intention right now is when he produces the list that he needs to send to CSS, it's got all of the courses, it has all of the you know, departments, it has all of the faculty. We're just going to take that list, sort it by department and faculty member, and we're going to send it to the department head. And we're going to send, we're going to ask, would you please let us know whether the faculty member wants paper and pencil, whether they want it by WIC, the app, or whether they want it by email. And the only email that we're going to offer are totally online courses. So we're going to ask the department head to infuse themselves into this and go to the faculty member and say, Jeff, you got three courses, how do you want them? Jeff's going to say, uh, I'll use the paper and pencil. You give me three clicks and you're done. And we'll have them send that report back to Don, and then we'll have it all ready to go. We can send it directly up to CSS, and we're done. We don't have to get all this hard copy letter traffic moving back and forth. We're going to continue to require our part-timers, since it's not a contractual issue, at least not yet until we finish the contract. Um, we're going to require the, the uh, part-timers to use the WIC, Okay, unless they're teaching totally online and then they'll use the email. Okay, but for the full time, we'll go to the department heads and ask for that. And by hopefully the second or third time we do this, the department head will know what Jeff wants. Uh, he uses, you know, he uses paper and pencil all the time. I'm not even asking. Or maybe I'll ask him, but it'll be very quick. Okay, so that's what we intend to do. Any questions? There was two other things that came to mind while you were talking. Um, we spoke briefly about normative data, and what I wanted to mention to you is that I'd say 85-90% of our customers are using customized surveys, so they're developing their own questions, and hmm. those questions are also developed for RMU, are you know, unique to your institution. To do a normative data analysis, you would have to have the same questions stated the same way, delivered the same way, in the same type of environment, same political arena. Everything needs to be completely the same across the board. And you, that's very difficult to get. I mean, you can do it, and you can put your, your money on that. But for the most part, you're asking an awful lot to try and create normative data. Um, we don't have normative data because our customers are all asking different questions and in different manners. So we'll have the normative data within this university as much as we can. You know, we're, we're going to keep those same 13 questions. And like I said, at, at least that's the thinking right now. And, and, and ask the departments and the programs, if you want four additional questions or three additional questions, uh, you'll be able to do that. Right. And we had talked about that briefly before this meeting that in, in the future, you're going to probably have an area for departments um, or programs to ask questions for all of the courses within your area. 
I would definitely do that only with online because then if you're looking at printing different paper surveys, that's a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, the online system can be free for those additional questions. And what I mean by free is we'll give you an open area, let's say five, six, seven, eight questions, whatever you need, that says these questions here are designed by your department or your instructor you know, please check with them to see what the questions are. And then as an instructor or a department head, you hand out and say, okay, questions 14 to 20 are to be answered with these questions. And we'll give you a rating scale of strongly agree to strongly disagree, formulate your questions to be answered in that particular manner. And then you can tell them, whether it be like via email, whether it's a memo or you write it on the board, however you want to do it, or Don, I can even print them on that yellow cover sheet and they can be right there ready for the class. But in that manner, if it's an open area and you're developing those questions and we're not printing them or uploading them online, it's free. I'm not charging Robert Morris anything. What I will do is I will give you the responses back. You can see how they scored them. You know, question 14 had re these responses from 15. You can ask commentary questions and have those response, you know, gathered also. But I'm not going to charge anything if they're open areas. If you come to me and say, for this department, I want these five questions populated online, and another department wants seven questions populated online, then I'm designing different surveys online and uploading them and creating new programs for data collection. So that's point. where so we got to we got to think about that. You can add different questions, but if you create a different instrument, it's going to cost it's going to cost us. Right. That. So we'll and, talk and if it's a blank area, I mean, if you've got five open areas to enter questions, you can change that every semester. So every time your courses are changing, your semesters are changing, you can revise those questions and there's no charge. You just need to keep track of what you asked. So keep a copy of what the questions were and you'll see what the responses relate to. Okay, any other questions right now? Okay, why don't we go ahead and turn that off.